Hi there, my name is Jack Griffiths, and I'm finishing up my undergrad computer science major and applied music technology minor. My presentation today is on the capstone project for my music technology minor under Dr. Keith Hamill. The project is a mapping tool written in Max MSP and JavaScript for the Leap Motion Controller. It is still a work in progress, but I'm excited to show you what I have so far. The motivation behind this project is to basically find a way to streamline the process of mapping data, aka associating a data source to a destination, and being able to easily adjust these connections in a centralized location. The project aims to simplify the process of setting up for a performance, allowing the user to focus more on the creative aspects. To start, a little bit about the Leap Controller. It is an optical hand tracking module that is mainly used in virtual or mixed reality development such as video games and interactive kiosks. It is able to track both hands of a user simultaneously with high degrees of accuracy and tracks information such as hand and finger positions, velocity, and rotation. As you can see in the picture, the user is picking some virtual flowers through it. A Max program, or patch, is made up of objects connected to each other with cables. However, not all patches are this clean. When programs get complicated, you can easily end up with this, or this. My patch intends to avoid this by automating many of the connections and centralizing the adjustment of the parameters. So let's take a look at how the patch works. So firstly, we need to get the raw data from the Leap Controller into Max. And here I am using a great little object created by Martin Ritter called MRLeap. Martin is a former master's student from UBC and has created many great objects. MRLeap basically separates the data into various categories such as hands and fingers, ready to be sent off into the following steps. Data from MRLeap comes out like this image on the left, so I created some objects that I call components to take this data and extract some meaning out of them. For instance, this one in the middle is for left hand position, where these three columns represent the x, y, and z axes. For the Leap Controller, x is moving the hand left and right, Y is up and down, and Z is forward and backwards. A lot of this project utilizes these simple send and receive objects, so I'll quickly introduce them here as well. Data will be sent to receive objects with the same name, as demonstrated here. These are very useful, especially for sending data across different patches, where a direct cable connection would not be possible. This picture accurately sums up how I felt about using JavaScript in this project. On one hand, it is a powerful tool. On the other, a source of frustration. In order to add automation into Max, JavaScript was needed. I'm using JavaScript here to spawn in new objects, dynamically adjust the object's positions on the screen, load data, and detect objects present on the patch. However, this proved to be challenging for a couple of reasons. First, documentation was very hard to come by. The main tools of my arsenal were an ebook that I found online that was published in 2006, a couple of forum posts from the early 2010s, and Max built-in documentation. And second, the version of JavaScript that is included in Max is surprisingly old, and many of the functions that I would expect from it do not exist, such as for eaches and directly retrieving values from objects. Nothing that can't be worked around, but I found it interesting that this was a problem. And now for the meat and potatoes of my program. Here is an example of how parameters for an object are loaded. So we have this reverb object in the top right, courtesy of UBC Toolbox. The reverb object is a scripting name, which is just a name that you can give in Max that allows JavaScript to see it. More details on that later. Then we have this JSON file shown on the left, which is basically a text file that is formatted and structured. For each of the buttons and sliders that I would like to control on the reverb object, I add it to the JSON file, specifying the type of data it is, the minimum and maximum range that the reverb object can handle, and a pair of default values to start off with. These names, such as Reverb Time and Reverb Room, are actually received names, which a user can use to automate the reverb's parameters without interacting with the knobs and sliders directly. With my program, it will detect that this reverb object is present by looking for its scripting name, and then load these parameters, which are the received names, into a drop-down menu, which can then be selected by a user to instantly connect an attribute from the leap controller, such as hand position, to an attribute on the reverb object. Selecting one of these attributes will also load the fields shown here in the JSON file, 
to the other columns in the row. Here is a small demo for my project. In the top half, you can see my program in blue. On the left panel, you can see several buttons that you can click on. When we click on one of them, it brings in the component and tiles it automatically along the top. As you can see, there are some errors here because some of these components have not been completely implemented. The tiling of the components is done using JavaScript, and as you can see, it dynamically changes depending on when units spawn in and out. Along the bottom are just some effects from the UBC toolbox and a sampler player. So let's go ahead and initialize the program by just resetting and pressing the init button. As we can see in the logs, we can see some of the objects that are present, including the harmonizer, the delay, and the reverb. This is because my program recognizes these from their scripting names. Let's go ahead and turn on the left-hand position and start the leap controller. As you can see here, I have my leap controller. And if I put my hand over the top, you can see that my position gets tracked. The X position is currently mapped to the harmonizer volume, so you can see that go up and down as I move my hand left and right. The X axis now controls the harmonizer's volume. We're also able to add more mappings to the rows by simply selecting more in the dropdown. We now have three attributes mapped to the hand position. They are the harm harmonizer volume, harmonizer transpose, and harmonizer delay, each mapped to one of the three axes. The drop-down menu contains all of the received names that we saw earlier in the JSON. Objects that are detected in the patch then have their received names loaded into the drop-down menu. We're able to change the output type for a certain row by selecting one of the, one of the items from the menu here. We're also able to adjust the output, the range of output, by sliding these values or entering a custom value. As you can see, we have the values between 48 to 88, and that is the output range that will show up on the harmonizer volume. If we wanted to create a custom receive for this program, there are a few steps that we'll need to take. First of all, we'll need to create the receive object. For now, we'll call it sampler pitch, and let's hook it up to the sample player and this number box so we can see what's going on. Next, we need to change the scripting name. So let's change the scripting name to be demo. Now my program will recognize this object as demo. Next, we'll need to come into the data JSON and add demo to this file. There is already data for the reverb, the delay, and the harmonizer. We can add in our custom receive by adding something that looks like this, where the scripting name is demo, the receive name is sampler pitch, the type is integer, the minimum and maximum values are between 24 and 100, and the default values are 40 to 80. So let's save that and go back to the patch. Let's reset the patch. Demo now appears in the logs. This indicates that my program has detected it. So now if we spawn in left-hand position again, we can see that sampler pitch is on the drop-down menu. Once we have sampler pitch selected, we can immediately move your hand across the leap controller, and the X position will now trigger different pitches on the sampler. From there, we can then map another row, say the Y position, to let's use delay time. Now we have the X position mapped to the playing of samples and the Y position mapped to the delay effect. From this short demo, we can see how fast it is to set up a mapping between the leap controller and any receive object, and also how to create your own custom configurations with ease. Future steps for this project include finishing the implementation for other components such as hand velocity and rotation, and developing the program to be more user-friendly and intuitive. Thank you for listening to my presentation, and feel free to reach out if you have any questions or feedback.